Okay, so this is this was like an example of a box that came back. These guys were fairly destroyed. There were things that had come unpinned and they were rolling around in here. So you can see all the parts of wings and everything. And so um, a few of them are still intact. Um, but and then some you just have like, oh, here's a head, here's a thorax. <laughs> and like there's nothing else attached to it. So, but so this they, they get shipped, sent back like this. So they're not frozen. And, and so these just go straight into this little thing for relaxing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then some of them obviously go better than others when you try to spread them. And these are these guys are already two years old, which is not ideal um, for it pinning. Shattered. Because yeah, and so like these three, I had to glue abdomens back on, and and, and others like if I wasn't convinced, I knew which abdomen went with which inside. So I wasn't doing it. So what's the I've, purpose of, of pinning all these down? Is it, are you guys doing? Basically, they're going to end up at the Smithsonian, so there's no pressure there. Um, and so I was like, you know, hi, learn how to do this and we'll sit this in the Smithsonian. So Lee has extensive collections at both the Smithsonian and the American Museum, and some of these probably haven't even been described to science yet. So some of these probably don't even have a genus and species associated with them yet. So ultimately, you know, the taxonomists take over, and so they need to be able to see all the morphological details. So you know, when you look at like. The goal is to get them looking as possible to um, you know, all of these examples where you have as many body parts intact, the wings are spread, and even though it might be in a natural position for them, you know, as they would normally fly around and rest and everything, this is how they want them oh, done for museum yeah. collections. And so again, you can see as many details as possible. And then when you flip okay. them over, you can also see the underwing patterns and things like that. And ideally, an antennae are intact and legs are intact. And um, So how many examples of one species do you need? You know, I don't know, because I know for some of these, there are hundreds of what we assume is the same species. But So I think the goal is for some of these that are all being shipped back to Ecuador that ultimately as right, they do maybe some of the ID stuff right. first, yeah. you know, then they'll say, okay, right. let's paint right. 25 of these. We just always have to throw these in here. 400, you right, know, right. so, so yeah, but the, we have, I don't think it's been quite organized mm -hmm. to that point yet. So, and then different people want to do different things with them. So, I mean, like there. the traditional and hang tax on this will often, they'll look at the genitalia that's housed within the abdomen and they'll make species determinations based on that, which is obviously insanely and, um, painstaking. And, you know, you're looking into a dissecting scope and yeah, you know, there's really and tiny morphological details. But one of the you know, newer things is to do the, the PCR with the DNA um, and look at DNA sequencing and things like that. And so for that, apparently they often use legs. And unfortunately, with a lot of these guys, they come back, you know, sometimes they're missing legs, sometimes they have a couple legs, sometimes in the process of doing this. So they just pick it off the collection so, box? So well, they'll just take out what they need? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I don't know any like said, they're different people involved, so some of these I think now are getting shipped to Jim Miller, who is like, he is a curator of some of this stuff, and he's now in Washington State. So I think some are getting shipped directly to him, I'm hoping for like at least initial ID, at least down to the family level, so you can say, okay, these are all geometrids, or okay, these are all noctuids, or whatever. And then, and then I think they're going to be shipped here, so they can be spread and pinned and logged into this database and it starts my understanding is like in Ecuador they have this you know database so they're all as you guys have seen up at Sage they're all numbered mm -hmm. photos are taken and everything in the caterpillar stage um, and then on through ideally you know, the adult stage if they, if they make it to that point and actually close and so It's a, a plant. The leaf. <laughs> the leaf, yeah. Okay. So it started out as a big leaf. It's a native plant. It's, it's really big leaves. So we took the leaf and we grinded it up into a powdery compound, which you can see over there. And uh, one of our teammates took the compound and mixed it with methyl and okay. ethanol and water. And it made that substance. Once that heat up and mix up... Looks like a mojito. It does, huh? <laughs> it's going to look like this. This is after that composition sit for three days. Once it sit for three days, you get this. Now what we're doing with this machine is taking this fluid. We want to pull out the chemical that we're only interested in. So in this 
to where he moves the rotation so that he even once they heat the liquid that she put in there, the ethanol and the water, is gonna come out in this machine, this little bottle. So you're making like a a distillation? Yes. So we use the ethanol and water to make the guy change from a powder to a liquid. Uh -huh. But then we need to pull out the chemical that we're interested in. So we heat it and extract the ethanol and water that we put in there before, which comes in this bottle. Uh -huh. And then we're left with the chemicals that we need. However, because we pull these chemicals out, it changes its uh, consistency. It looks really liquidy, but it's going to change to a thicker, more molasses-like Oh, and that's what we're working on. Now, what we're going to do after we get it, <laughs> to be continued. Yeah, it's a little tricky at times. Yeah, I hope usually right around the neck there, just give a little wiggle. So that was the water that just came off? Just water? Uh, water and ethanol. Oh, nothing. The same solution. So the stuff inside is getting more and more concentrated? Yeah. yeah. So was the water coming out of here, the ethanol here, or was it? Both. So um, this is where it mostly collects, uh -huh. but sometimes it'll collect in here uh -huh. um, before it gets filtered through. So we have to dump this. Too. For, our, for our young viewers out there, why is uh, how would that stuff collect? Like why? What's the process? It has a lower boiling point uh -huh. than the solution we want to collect. So uh -huh. when we heat it. It boils, but the solution we need doesn't boil, so it stays here. Uh -huh. So this boils up, and it collects here. So this condenses it back into a liquid, so we can collect it. So the liquids go from uh, like a gas to a, a liquid? Yeah, so that's so a liquid, liquid to a to gas. gas to a liquid, I guess. Uh -huh. And it's cooling as it goes along the... Yeah. Oh, I see. This whole thing is called a uh, roto vapor. Yeah? Roto vap. Roto vap. Five million dollars. <laughs> so what she's pouring in is the like the non-purified one? Yeah, so it has the solution we need plus water and energy. Is that it? Oh, I see. So this, this device here creates the vacuum. Is that right? Well, once we plug it. Once you plug it? Is the vacuum, that's what this noise is making? That's the vacuum pump? No, so that's this. So, yeah, it pulls it. But this kind of creates the vacuum, so it increases the pressure. Oh, and what's the tubes up there? Um, it keeps it, it keeps it pure. Keeps it what? It keeps it pure. The, the coil. The coil. Yeah, the coil keeps it pure. So the coil, the water in the coil is not, is not. No, no, no. The water in the coil is cool, so oh. that when the gas comes up, it can condense. And, oh, I see. And collect it. So plug it. And this is just a water bath down here. This is what's heating this fluid, so this is hot water. What temperature do they put the water, do you know? That's 77 degrees. So at that temperature, the ethanol and the water, because it's low pressurized, it'll boil out. So like a normal, normal boiling point would be like 100 degrees yeah, 100. Fahrenheit? But because makes it's it under pressure. It's just like going up an elevator. Yeah. <laughs> 
Class. Like this is an extraction experiment? This is for kids. This would be like something that would do in chemistry. Oh, just I like see. extracting. Mm -hmm. like. Is there a specific name for that column? Uh, this is uh, flash chromatography. Flash chromatography. So I think we have most of the bubbles seem to be out. It's just like creating bubbles. So. Oh, you see something. Content. I know. Do you need narration? What's that? So do you need narration? So you're trying to knock out the bubbles? Yeah. I'm trying to get it from the, so there's bubbles coming up from the bottom. I'm just trying to stop that. But this is all right. Okay, let's put a little bit more chloroform in here. Go ahead. The chloroform. <laughs> Yeah. It's what the CIA uses, right? Yeah. Huh? We're not getting much ethanol in the water pulled out. Does it take a while? Maybe because it's good. Uh, let's see. Let's see, there's a hole in here. So feeling kind of dizzy. Hmm? I'm feeling kind of dizzy. You're feeling dizzy? Oh, the chloroform? Yeah. I'm going to hold it against it your, your mouth. Like the tiniest peak in the back, you know, and, make and take you hostage. <laughs> yeah. Tomorrow. Okay. Is that okay? That's good. Okay. So now what we wanted, let's put a little more in there just mm -hmm. in case. So once you have the column built, you don't want that silica to ever dry out on top because then you have air bubbles that are coming through. And the idea is that if you have a bunch of air bubbles, you have this inconsistent matrix. And so you want this really solid matrix. All right, that's good. Pull out See, because it's quicker than if you just let things kind of drip through by itself. So, put this on here. And these things, I broke two already because I wasn't very careful. I, what I, what I did is I manipulated the air without having it my hand on it. So what I do is I like to turn it on. I always touch it when I turn this off. And so it won't sit, sit tight. Oh, so you blew it off the top and it smashed? Um, and so, yeah, what happened is I had it like this and I, I thought I went to turn it off and I accidentally turned it on uh -huh. and it flew off and, you know, crashed. So now you'll see this line right here. So what you can do is kind of hold this and you see how it's compressing. Oh, that's cool. So somebody could do that. You can put your thumb over, hold it and put your thumb over there and kind of control the, you see how it's starting to compress that layer. So it's pushing the silica down um, okay, awesome and making picture, it kind of tightening yeah. it up in there. Why do we want to push all the liquid through? Um, no, we don't want the liquid to touch the surface because um, once we get bubbles on that surface, then we're going to have bubbles that are going to try to go all the way through and it just it will ruin the column. So we just we want to get it till it stops compressing so then we can then throw our sample on top, but we still want chloroform on, on top of it. So when the second line stops moving, the yeah, stops then, we'll, then we'll say it's nice and compressed. <laughs> Sort of. So we put about 200 mils in there, um, and the column holds about a little more than 250 altogether. But you know, when you pour it in, it's not really. It depends on how the density and how tight it is. So do you always go to the same amount of air pressure every time too? Um, or does that matter? Like, that doesn't matter too much. When you're, what, the one thing you do want to do is just try to be really consistent. Right now we're just trying to push it down so she can put lots of air on there. But normally when you're when we're running the column, we don't want it to run too quick. The solvent to run too quickly because things may not it may not let things have a chance to slow down to to separate as nicely. Uh -huh. I think it stopped. Okay, that's probably about it's probably dense enough at least. Okay. So now what we need to do is you can yeah, pull that, turn that off. So this is our sample. So what this is right here 
So you guys made the extract and then they're drying down the extract. And then what we do with that dried down extract is we do uh, solvent partitioning where we wash it with ethanol, or ether, and then N-butanol. And this is the N-butanol layer which pulls off main, the catalpicide and a couple of other impurities that we're not interested in. And so what we did was then we, and it was sort of just more of like a residue, um, then we added silica to it and um, added, so, so we dissolved it in methanol, added silica and dried it back down. And this is what's called a dry loading of a flash cover top, if you want to call them. And what it does is it lets, it, sit, it lets the sample sit really nicely on top here. So what we need to do is, let's close her up. Let's put this up here. And we want to throw our sample now on top. And we kind of want to get the most, most we always kind of want this layer to be nice and straight. Otherwise, if you have an angle, you can imagine that as things spread out, your angle gets amplified as you come down in the different illusions. So we want to kind of make sure everything's kind of flat across. So what we do is you kind of end up, you know, kind of moving the little tip of this around and making sure you kind of, kind of get it all. It'll tend to settle flat anyways. And you see how this kind of settles pretty nice and flat. So, um, so yeah. How do I put it in there? So you can, you just use this and okay. kind, of, just kind of, you know, like tilt it up and scrape it. So chloroform and methanol is the actual solution, um, but we were hoping that our column had solidified enough, but it's looking like it's not quite there yet, but we'll see what happens. We'll settle and see what happens. Um, it's also the bigger chunks that went through, so something we could do is um, take a little knife and try to this, yeah, here, try to put a little bit more in there and see if it, how if it settles nice, pretty well. No, it looks like it's doing all right now. Did it bust through? No. Okay, cool. Then we can just go from there. Come on in. Um, you know, kind of go around at different angles. You might get more on this side. Okay. And sometimes you can beat it with that little hose and that'll help knock it, like, kind of over a little bit. beat it too. <laughs> you know, you all about the that. trees really got us. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like high school kids. Giggling. Yeah, yeah. She said beat it. <laughs> oh, more sand or yeah, you want it like that. Yeah. Yeah. so all around. You can't really put too much on there, it's just more of a protection. So the more the better.
and I'll tell you when to release pressure so I can stop this. So weird. It's like all this stuff my teacher wouldn't let us do. Like, we can never, he wouldn't let us run a chromatography with pressure. And you'll get like less pure of a sample. So what's the process now? What are we doing? We're actually running the sample through the silica, and then we're collecting it at different volume intervals to collect different samples, because they all run Smaller at different... Smaller particles will go lower. Yeah, well, we'll go faster, but it's also with their polarity and what they're attracted to. I don't know what the silica is made out of exactly. Get ready to move use pressure. Not yet, almost. Oh. And... Do you want to take a picture of me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go for it. He's <laughs> one to the other and he's like, do you just stop? 